sit here and talk about this guy for a long time, but my attempt is just simply to get you interested in literature, get you interested in reading. And when I say reading, I'm not talking about a Kindle, I'm talking about an actual book. The old style books, right? Yes, get you back into some lecturing and get you into some reading so you can take your mind and expand it. That's what we really like to do with these types of lectures. All right, let's take a look at this gentleman. Let's go all the way back. We're going to go many, many years back. We're going to go back to the year that he was born. He was born in 1899. Everybody thinks it's in the Caribbean. It's not. It's in Oak Park, Illinois. He's from the Midwest, right there in the suburbs of Chicago in 1899. Hey, think about it, folks. 1899, that was an exciting time because it was the turn of the century. They were just about to go into a new century. It was an exciting time. Just like, uh, say, you and I at the 2000 mark in 1999 was going to be, oh, it's a new, fresh, new start, new day. It was an electric time to be alive at the turn of the century when the 1900s were coming. And the little old Hemingway house up there in Oak Park, they were really excited. They were about to get their very first child. Oh, Daddy was so excited. He was going to have a little boy teach him how to hunt, teach him how to fish. Teach him how to go out there and be a real man. Oh, but Mama was more excited because she was going to have a little girl. She was convinced that this baby was a little girl. She could tell by the way it moved. She could tell when she hung that thread on that needle and the way that needle wiggled. She knew this was going to be a girl convinced a thousand percent. Wasn't going to have it any other way. Well, the day come for the little boy to be born. And it comes out a little boy. Oh, Daddy was happy. We're going to name him Ernest. He was an excited guy. Him a little boy just like he wanted. Mama was furious. <laughs> Extremely angry. How could this little kid come out to be a boy? I didn't want a boy. I wanted a girl. Felt it was almost a curse. She didn't like the child. And as the child got over, he didn't like her either for many, many reasons. F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, you know, Ernest Hemingway is probably the only man I've ever heard of that actually hates his mama. Now, his mama gave him lots of reasons. Understand, she gave him a lot of reasons. She wanted a girl. She wasn't going to have a boy. And when it came time to dress him for pretty much his whole life, in the beginning, it was dressed girl. I say it because it was so confusing for Ernest. He's a boy. Mama's dressing him as a girl. Now notice the picture on the lower down there. That's how Daddy dressed him when he would take him out hunting and fishing into the woods. Pretty much the only time the poor little kid ever got to dress as a boy. But when Mama sent him to school, when Mama sent him to church, when Mama was out with him, this was her little girl. By the way, he overcompensated for the rest of his life for the way that he was started out, by the way he was simply dressed. He had to overcome adversities his whole life, starting at a very, very early age. But he did start dressing himself when he became old enough, and he did make the choice of dressing like a boy, and he started school. When he started school, he started doing really well, but he had to overcompensate for what his mother was doing to his mind, what his mother was doing to everybody that he knew. Oh, this is my little girl. He used to tease him about it. He used to embarrass him, humiliate him. He overcompensated for his whole life to become the man's man. In high school, signed up for some sports, played football, wrestling, loved boxing his entire life. Loved boxing. Even later in life, owned his own boxing ring in Key West. Oh, he overcompensated to become the boy, the boy, and then the man's man. He was a good student, by the way. He was a really, really good student. His teachers loved him. They found that he shined in his courses, especially one teacher he had that was his speech teacher and his English teacher. When he submitted works, the works were completely different than any other kid had ever submitted. His writing was a unique style for that time. It was a very unique direction for anyone, especially at his age, to tackle a topic. The teacher told him, Ernest, you've got to find something to do for your career. You've got to find something to do that's going to take care of you and your future family for the rest of your life. And I see a gift in you, young man. It's called writing. You need to continue to write. Focus on that as a career. This is a good idea. Ernest loved this idea. He enjoyed the idea of 
getting a pen and a paper and creating something that is unarguable, that is personally his thoughts, his words, and others would go out and enjoy it and accept it. So he did. He put his eyes on the career of being a writer, started to make applications, and he got his very first writing job. It was a place called the Kansas City Star. He became a cub. Now, a cub is a very important position. A cub to the editor means when you bring it back, make sure there's two creams and a sugar. <laughs> hey, it's where he had to start, right at the bottom like all of them do in that field. And he did. He was assigned out by the editor to journalists. The journalists would go out into the field. When they would go out into the field, they would take the documentation of all the stories. They would write about what people were wearing. What did it look like? What did it smell like? What did people say? They would take all those words, put them into stories, submit the story to the editor. The editor would approve it. It would end up in the Kansas City Star. Ernest would go along with that journalist with his own little paper and pen, and he would write the same things down, come back, and he would write his own story. Practicing because one day he may actually be a journalist, a writer for the Kansas City Star. Took it to the editor. Hey, by the way, boss, just showing you something. What do you think of this? The editor would sit back at his desk, scratch his head, look at it, and say, this is really good work. Really good work. But remember, you're a cop. You're not a journalist yet. Yes, but it doesn't mean that I can't one day be a gentleman. Maybe one day. What if one day, if I keep doing this, would you ever consider putting it in print? You're a little ways away from that quality. Why don't you do this? Take this story, go back, rewrite it, bring it back. Okay, boss, I'll do that. What do you want me to rewrite? Is it too many paragraphs? What do you think about it? You're going to figure that out. Rewrite it, bring it back. Ernest would go back, he'd rewrite it, he'd come back to the editor. You're almost there, keep working on it. But what do I need to change? You'll figure it out, son, you'll figure it out. This process could go on four, five, six times. It was so important that the editor not tell him what he was doing right or wrong. This is called learning. And every time he brought it back, he got a little bit closer. Finally, the journalist editor sat him down and said, Son, you want to be a journalist? I love what you're doing with your writing. Let me give you some advice. The advice he gave him was probably without question the best advice Ernest Hemingway ever received. It is this advice that changed the literary world. I love the fact that you use short sentences. Everybody else is writing words and words and words to describe and make sure that the reader can see what was in the journalist's eyes and the story that was told. But you can do it with very short sentences. Short first paragraphs. This is a brilliant style. They're turning in three pages. You're turning in three words and getting it across with power and conviction. And you're doing it with a wonderful flow of smoothness. And I love the fact, Ernest, that you're positive in your writing. Not negative like a lot of my journalists. He was positive when he wrote. He would be horrible in the media today. Because he was positive, right? I can tell you some TV stations he'll never get a job at today if he was still alive, right? But he was positive. This was a unique way of writing. The world had not seen this before. And he kept submitting those little articles to the editor. The editor kept working with him to become better and better. You know what, son? Forget the idea of being a journalist. One day, you actually could be in my chair. You have the talent, young man, of being an editor of the paper. An editor? Never thought of that. I could be the editor in charge. Maybe one day in charge of the whole paper. Maybe one day, what if I had my own paper? Oh, he set out the destiny. He figured out what his destiny was going to be. He was going to be an editor of a newspaper. Maybe even one day create his own paper. So everybody had his style of writing. It was a great time to be Ernest Hemingway. Young, with a vision ahead of him. Very clear, detailed vision of what life was going to be for Ernest Hemingway. Until one day, <coughs> everything changed. For many young men back there, everything changed. Now when I say everything changed, he received a letter from his uncle, Sam. The uncle told him, you now are going to change your life. 
Oh, listen, folks. When that letter came in, your life changed immediately. See, the men, when they got the letter from Uncle Sam, you're going to war. You're going to the military. Oh, no. What about my plans? What about my dreams? My aspirations? What about my life? I've lost the choices that I was going to make for myself. This is not right. This is not fair. That's the direction that men took. Not Ernest Hemingway. He was excited. I'm going into the war. I'm going into the military. Think about it. I'm broke. I have no money. I'm going to be able to travel on their dime. I'm going to be able to tell stories in places in the world that I can never get to myself. This is going to be awesome. It's going to be perfect for a future journalist, for a future editor. He was very excited. Started putting his documents together. Got his passport pulled all of his birth certificates and personal paperwork together. Once he had all of that all together, he went down to the board, submitted it all. They put him into his physical where he was denied with bad eyesight. How do you correct bad eyesight? By the way, there were no LASIK surgeons back there. Bad eyesight meant you were immediately denied. When he was denied, they basically told him no. Nobody ever told no to Ernest Hemingway, and he accepted the first time he hears it. He said, I'm going to war. I'm going to battle somehow, some way. And he figured out that angle. The angle was he volunteered for the war. By volunteering for the war, he was able to go overseas on their money. He was able to go right to the front lines as an ambulance driver, delivering very, very important cargo, chocolates, to the front line. Oh, you laugh. Listen, if you were on the front line, chocolates were very important cargo at that time. Oh, it was a great time. He was able to go all the way to the front lines, pull out a pen and paper, start documenting and telling the stories onto his tablet from all of the soldiers that he would meet, from all of the wonderful places he would go, until one day in July 8th, he was shot right through the door of the ambulance. Shrapnel flies in and wounds our young Hemingway. Throws him right into the hospital. Look at the pain! <laughs> Not much pain, is there? Put him right in the hospital. Oh, this took the wind out of him. I'm telling you, it set it back. It wasn't an easy, easy thing to overcome. But he had to have a nurse there to take care of him, and she did. She took real good care of him. Her name was Agnes von Krausky. Not only did she mend his body, but she made his heart flutter. He liked her. You know what? She liked him. And they really started hitting it off. And it was a great time. He was falling in love for the very first time. He was excited. And then he got another letter from his uncle. The uncle said, you're going to be sent back to Oak Park, Illinois as a wounded soldier. He heard, you're going home to mama. <laughs> this is not the place this man wanted to be going. It was Oak Park, Illinois. Well, what about, what about Agnes? What about her? This is going to tear me. Finally, I've given my heart to someone, and now I'm going to be separated by battle. They're sending me back home. Honey, don't you worry, she told him. Don't worry, sweetheart. I'll follow you. Let me shut things down here. Give me 30 days. Go home. Don't worry. And in 30 days, I'll knock on your door, and I'll be there, right there to take care of you, just like I have for the last few months. And Ernest went back home, waited anxiously, 30 days later, there's a knock on the door. They open up the door. He received a letter from Agnes. I have fallen in love with another soldier. <laughs> he was crushed. This is the first little puppy love. He was crushed, devastated. How is he going to overcome? What is it with these women in his life, he said later. What is it? He couldn't quite figure out what to do. And this one really knocked him on his feet. And he was not doing well, but he had to recuperate on his own. And he did. And he turned to what he knew was best for Ernest. He turned to the pen and the paper. And he started compiling his stories. He started compiling stories about his true adventures in his life. His first true adventure was being shot. But this is where headlines were created. Ernest Hemingway 
He created the short, simple, catchy, powerful, powerful headlines that many magazines now use today. Newspaper man survives 200 battle wounds. That'll make a read. Oak Park boy shot to pieces and jokes about it. Yankee punctured by 227 pieces of Austrian shrap. Oh, they read the stories because he came out a hero when you read him. But look who wrote him. He was able to rewrite literature right there and just simply recreating the headlines using the advice that the editor gave him. Short paragraphs, short sentences, powerful words, son. Powerful. Keep doing what you're doing and keep them positive. And he did. But it wasn't long after that that his little heart started to flutter again. He met a really nice lady. Her name was Hadley Richardson. Oh, by the way, Hadley came from money. And we're not talking about a little bit of pocket change and folding money. We're talking about big, deep, aristocrat money. She was rich. And Ernest loved her, not for the money. He loved her because he loved women. He really, overall, loved women. And you know what? On September 1921, he got down on one knee and he proposed. And she said yes, and they got married just within the same month. By the way, take a good look at that picture. That's the last time you'll ever see Ernest Hemingway without a mustache. Later in his life, he would grow a beard to cover that pale Midwestern skin in the Caribbean sun. At that young age, he grew that mustache. Be a man's man because women can't grow mustaches. Or grow a mustache. And he kept it for the rest of his life. No dress is ever going to fit on this man ever again. And they were happy. Well, Hadley says, honey, we got to find somewhere to live. Mama said, by the way, i got that back bedroom right back there, son, in the back of that old park house. You're welcome to have your... Mama won't bother you at all. <laughs> right. So he looked at Hadley and he says, Mama wants us to live in Oak Park. What do you think? She said, honey, I'm fine if you want to live in Oak Park. We can. He says, i got a better idea. Paris! She'll never come over there. <laughs> He got advice to move to Paris. They told him. They said, Ernest, you're unique. You're very unique with your writing. That's where geniuses are. You need to go to Paris. Go to the bistros. Hang out at night. Talk to the geniuses in there. And by the way, I must agree with everything I read. That is the best spot Ernest Hemingway could have ever been. In the early 1920s, there was a revolution, a revolt of creation going on within the world. Not only just the writing world where he was recreating it, there was other people, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ezra Pound. Many of them were recreating, completely recreating literature. At the same time, the art world was being recreated. You see, the museums and the galleries and the rich were telling the artists, this is art. The artists were saying, I beg to differ. I'm the one that painted it. I'm the one that sculpted it. I created it. How can you say it's not art if I say it is? I'm the creator. I'm right. Museums and galleries said, no, we're right. There was a fight. So much of a fight that it showed up in your art today that you love. One of those gentlemen sitting at that bistro right across from young Hemingway was a gentleman that was hired to do portraits on a regular basis. Because that's who had the money to have paintings done with rich. The rich would come in, they'd pay for the portrait. The women would sit down, and this artist, just to make his point that it was his idea of what art is, and not the museums and galleries, he'd take their neck and stretch them like 18 inches long. Modigliani. Geniuses. Geniuses. One man had the audacity to take his canvas and his easel outside, put it by a lily pond, and paint in the open air because he could look at a leaf. He didn't see green. He saw 30 shades of green. He didn't paint it as a perfect leaf. He, on the, <laughs> called it impressions. The art world said. Crack was what they said. Burn it. Not even worth good kindling. Don't waste a good match. There was a revolt. Artists were revolting. Art world. Writers, all artists in their own minds. One of these gentlemen that was from the art world, he recreated art, just like Hemingway did literature. This gentleman was named Picasso. When Picasso died to teach you 
you what genius looks like. He never allowed anyone in his studio, ever, where his works were. However, when he died, he couldn't stop. There was an estate that had to be settled. There had to be a value placed on his works. The estate hired a firm, they went in, and they counted how many works of art do we have here that are finished, that are complete products, and how many are unfinished that we could still claim as property and still get a price for that are unfinished. Picasso was working at one time on 5,723 unfinished works at the same time. That is genius. Picture Hemingway writing 5,000 books at the same time. These people were geniuses. And they all became good friends. They all became drinking brothers. They all became supportive of one another. Now, Ernest, old, Ernest, he started hanging around with a regular old posse. They became known as the lost generation, the people between two wars. But look at the names up there, Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Ford Max, James Joseph, Ezra Pound. These were great, great literary artists. He had surrounded himself with greatness. If there's any advice I could ever give a kid, be careful who you surround yourself with. That environment can change your world any way you want he surrounded himself with greatness from the literary world. He received contracts. He had to make some money. One of those contracts is from a place called the Toronto Star. The Toronto Star offered Ernest a contract to submit editorials about Europe. Well, what would you like? They said, that's up to you, sir. You're the genius. Bring Europe to Canada and the U.S. Bring Europe to North America. And he did it. If you've ever heard of the running of the bulls, that was a story he submitted. Have you ever heard of a festival where they throw thousands and thousands of tomatoes at each other? That was an editorial submitted by Mr. Hemingway. He brought Europe to the world, and he started writing. He completed a little bitty work called The Torrents of Spring, actually later ended up as an official first novel. But he sat down to write this novel, and he did. He sat down to write a specific novel, The Sun Also Rises. He and Hadley were doing good. Hadley came to visit him. She was so excited to come and visit him. She came to visit him in Europe. Now, while he was over there in Europe, and she's over there visiting him from her house across Europe, they lived on one end. He was all the way on the other. He said, do me a favor, sweetheart. On my desk, you'll find four manuscripts. On your way, would you do me a favor, stop by the post office, mail them to me, and make sure that you buy insurance for them. They're the only copies I have. Not a problem. They'll be there Sunday. Sunday came around. He opened up the door. There stood Hadley. Hi. I didn't know you were coming. Well, yes, I wanted to surprise you. I brought you your manuscripts. He said, fabulous. Where are they? She said, they are... Um, Honey, I left the bag on the train. The world has never seen those four manuscripts. Let's just say this created a little tension in the family. <laughs> she lost the first four great novels that Ernest Hemingway had ever completed. This started giving him some pressure. This started giving him some trouble. And at the same time, he was being pressured by his own literary world. He had submitted The Sun Also Rises as his first official novel. And when he did that, the critics started coming in. The critics were not the nicest of them. You surely are now famous as a writer. I shall trust that your future books will have a different sort of a subject matter. You have such a wonderful ability. We want you to be able to read and ask other people to enjoy your works. By the way, that was his daddy. <laughs> One of the filthiest books of the year. That was his mama. <laughs> the critics were hard. His marriage was struggling. It gave him a lot of problems with Hadley. He was a very unhappy man. And in the late 1920s, it all fell apart. And he had lost his wife to a divorce. Mm -hmm. Don't feel bad. It was his own fault. You see, this woman came into picture. He started a relationship with her while married with Hattie. He didn't have to go far. Pauline Pfeiffer was his wife's best friend. 
<laughs> Welcome to Hemingway. Well, Hanley realized what was going on. She gave him the ultimatum. She said, listen, you, Pauline, I'll give you a divorce. I'll get out of your way. You don't love me. I don't want to be around you either. But you got about 60 to 90 days, all right? I'll give you 90. And in 90 days, you can't speak. You can't talk. You can't communicate, socialize in any way with each other. And in 90 days, if you really, truly, Ernest, if you really love her more than me, I'll sign the papers. He fell in love even more with her. She signed the papers that next month, Pauline and Ernest married. Hadley had a stipulation. You can marry her, but you're not living in this house. Not here in Paris with me. Y'all gonna have to find somewhere else to live. Mama said I got that back bedroom right back here in Oak Park, Illinois. Feel free to come on back. And Ernest thought, how far can we get away from Mama? And he picked an island in the middle of nowhere. Mama can't get there. He picked Key West. That's a picture of Key West. That's a picture of the end of Duval Street, way back in the early, early days. You gotta remember, it was a very, very small island. There was only one train that could get any supplies in and out. You didn't even know when day it was gonna be coming into the island. Sometimes it'd be every two weeks, every three weeks, very hard to get supplies. That's an important story, that it's hard to get the supplies on the train. It was the only way you could get anything in. And anything big certainly got bulked as cargo for small things like food and provisions. Well, that's important because remember, this one came from even more money than the first one had. This one was really filthy rich. She had a rich, rich, rich family. One of those members was her uncle. His name was Gus. And old Gus said, hey guys, you're getting married. The least thing I can do is buy you a car. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll buy you a Model A convertible. It'll be canary yellow, black leather interior. People will see you all over that island. It'll be on that train in the next couple of days. Didn't show up. Week later, didn't show up. Next week, didn't show up. The next week, didn't show up. The Ford dealership started feeling bad about it. They were like, look, this thing should have been there three or four weeks. What can we do? He says, you can give me somewhere to live. Let's start there. Because they really didn't have a lot of money. They were really, really tight. He was a new rider just trying to get on the feet. They said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Right up above the dealership up here is a nice little apartment. Manager of the dealership is supposed to have it. He's done have it. He's got his own house. Why don't you stay up there? They said, great. We'll stay here until the car comes. And the car didn't come. The car didn't come. The car didn't. Finally, the car arrived. But he had started on focusing on what he loved to do. He began writing another novel, A Farewell to Arms. By the way, it was a great time to be Ernest Hemingway. Nice little island in the middle of the end of the, the end of Florida, right there at the beginning, right there at the touch, the end of the point ran the Gulf Stream. He loved to fish. He just didn't have anything to fish with. But he started making friends. Once he got out there and started making friends, he met a lot of people. The guy that owned the hardware store right down from the auto dealership, that was old Charlie Thompson. He had a 19-little foot boat. They went out all the time. Old Charlie took his best friend out, Joe. Joe owned the bar, called it Sloppy Joe Russell. Sloppy Joe's, you know that today. He started hanging around with these guys. They become good friends, actually. They kind of became known as the Key West Mafia. Because every day those men would all go off fishing. Every night come back, hang out at the bar, start talking about the stories. It was a great time to be a artist. That Gulf Stream was very, very important to the story. Because the fishing was incredible. Old Charlie said, Ernest, have you ever gone fishing? Absolutely, my daddy taught me how to fish. I can catch fish. Charlie said, what kind of fish do you catch? Bass, brim, trout. Charlie said, that's bait. <laughs> a fish? You need to come fishing. Took him out there on that boat. First time Ernest hooked a marlin, the fish wasn't hooked nearly as hard as the fisherman. And that man was hooked to fishing. Love the Gulf Stream. You see where that is? Right there, man. It's right at Key West. Ernest once later wrote, that the marlin would come in in schools as thick in that Gulf Stream like minnows in shallow water. It's a great time to be earnest. Everything changed, though. His father died. And then, by the way, it, it wasn't that his father died. His father one day chose to get out of his bed and walk downstairs to the kitchen and took a key out of a cabinet walked to his favorite gun rack and pulled out an old Civil War pistol and put it to his head. 
And that's what hurt Ernest more than anything was the fact that his father chose to die. How could he leave me? He's the only relative that I can depend on, that I can turn to. I certainly can't look at her. Ernest went to the funeral. Mama went to the funeral. They didn't even sit near each other. Never spoke one single word to each other the whole time. For it was Ernest's fault that his dad did that, according to her. The one man in his life he could count on was gone. Who did he have to turn to? Uncle Gus saw this young man struggling. Young, married, a kid, another one on the way. He said, son, you've got to settle down. You've got to settle down. Relax a little bit. You're a great writer. Continue to write. Put your feet on the ground. I'm doing the best that I can do, Gus. I'm doing the best that I can do. He says, I'm going to be your father. I'm going to take those shoes. I'm going to fill it for you. I'm going to do everything I can. How about this? Tell you what I'll do. I'm going to buy you guys a house. I'll buy you a house. They went out. They looked all over Key West. They found a fantastic house. They got 907 Whitehead. Many of you have been to Key West. You had the opportunity to tour that house. Nice little one acre. Looked like a little French Quarter Tudor. Two story. Beautiful canary yellow. Matched the car. $6,207 was paid for by that house. That's important. Remember that. Just over $6,000. i am going to bring that up in a minute. Old Gus signed the paperwork, put it in her name. Because that was his relative. Ernest didn't mind. Ernest was able to settle down a little. You got a, got a house, I got a car, got a great wife, got some kids, doing really well. I need to do one thing. I just need to focus on my writing. And he did. He focused on For Whom the Bell Tolls. And this became a good book. But remember, genius doesn't stop at one. At the same time, he wrote To Have or Have Not. He wrote The Snows of Kilimanjaro. He also wrote Death in the Afternoon and three more at the same time. Seven novels coming out of this man's head at the exact same time. An amazing feat for an author. Especially when you've heard of all of them because they all became bestsellers. And many, many went on even past that. It was a fantastic opportunity. Ernest was calm. He was relaxed. Every day he'd go fishing, every night he'd end up right up there. Swampy Joe's. That was his fishing buddy. I know it doesn't look like the place you toured, but that's the actual original location right around the corner. That was the first five years of that business. That's where Ernest bellied up to the bar before it was moved on Duval Street for you, the tourist. But that is the original location. When they tore that down, they found two manuscripts in the wall being used as insulation. Gifts from Ernest to Joe. Two manuscripts later to be released after his death. It was a great time. See, Ernest had a good normal day. Every morning he'd get up 6 a.m. in the morning. He'd park his rear end right there at that typewriter just like it was his religion. He'd start writing till noon. By noon, he'd call on his buddies out. They'd go out fishing all afternoon, come back sunburned with fish. By the end of the day, belly up to the bar. Let's talk about the stories we've been creating every single day. Oh, he was creating some writing material. One of those stories is very famous. It's the Dry Tortugas. He needed a good captain to take him out. He got Gregorio Frentes, actually a native of Cuba. Got him over from Cuba, brought him over, had him captain out his little boat. Off they went. But on this particular tour, things went upside down very fast and bad. Ernest would go out fishing for sometimes a week, half a week, two weeks. But on this particular fishing trip, he went way out, way past the dry tortugas. Had two marlins on the line. One on the back, one on the right. Ernest was reeling him in. In the meantime, the captain was looking at the weather. He said, cut the lines. We're leaving right now. We're not cutting the lines, Ernest. Argued. There's no way we're cutting these lines. We have two marlins on. He said, cut the damn lines. Ernest, at six foot four, stood up to the captain and said, maybe you're a boat, but these are my fish. <laughs> so he reeled in both fish against the captain's wishes, and off they went. The captain was right. Halfway back home, they hit a storm. Lightning was crashing. Thunder was rolling. The rain was pouring. The boat was too small for the size of the waves that the good Lord had given them. They were fighting for their lives. The captain screamed to the back of all of them, write down your wishes. Put them in your right front pocket, for you may not be found, but if you do, at least they'll know what your thoughts were. I just got to get them to Fort Jefferson. I just got to get him to the dry 
Tor tubers. If I can just get them there, I can put them into the back cove, we can get inside that fort, surely it'll protect us. The captain, the skill that he used to manage that little bitty tiny boat and get it into that little lagoon was amazing to Ernest. That captain saved Ernest Hemingway's life or we would be done with this story right here. He never forgot that captain for doing it. It was a fantastic time to be Ernest Hemingway, especially when you're a writer writing about your journeys. He did write another book. Now this was about his other friend, Joe Russell. See, Joe was a rum runner in the Prohibition. He used to rum run some liquor into the bottom of Florida. And Joe, Joe was a fantastic rum runner with his own little hidden boats. Oh, he'd tell the stories of Hemingway. Hemingway would write it down just like he was at a war interviewing the front lines. Oh, this was good. Hollywood found that book and said, you know what, that's a pretty good book. Hollywood came knocking and said, we're going to make it into a movie. Here's a check. Ernest looked at the check and said, how many books would you like? <laughs> they said, that's it, just this one. He hated the fact that they put Lauren Bacall, but he loved the fact that they used Bogart. That was his, that was his idol. Ernest couldn't wait. He went down with his wife. They got into the theater, sat down, grabbed their popcorn. Oh, this is going to be a good book, I can tell you what. Turned into a movie. Can't wait to see it. Thing came on three minutes into the movie. Three minutes into the movie. Got up through the popcorn. Got stormed out of the movie. Got home, contacted Hollywood. How dare you? What have you done to my story? Short paragraphs, short sentences, every word exactly picked. And you turned around and destroyed it. I don't even recognize it as a movie. They said, we have the right to do so. No, you don't. I'm the author. They said, Ernest, did you cash that check? Yes. They said, great. We'll buy more books. And they did. They bought over a dozen more books. He hated Hollywood, but he loved Hollywood life. Loved meeting Jimmy Stewart. Loved meeting Pat Threadhead. Loved Hollywood. Hated the industry. One time a reporter said, what do you feel about the success you're having in Hollywood? He said, look, you throw in your book, they throw you the money, you jump in your car, you drive it, help! Back to where you came. That was his opinion of Hollywood. Hated Hollywood. Loved their money. See, their money opened up doors of opportunities for him. And with that money, he was able to go all over the world. He went right to the front lines in Spain. Standing on the front lines once again in war. All the journalists would stand out there and they'd say, what are you doing? We're digging an irrigation ditch from the town. Oh, there's a story. Digging an irrigation ditch for the town. Artists would go, you, you guys do not know how to write. The story is that one year ago, none of us would be standing on this ground. That's the part of the story you need to write, not the fact they're digging a ditch to get to the water. He was so unique. He had a great time. In the meantime, his wife's back home in Key West. She's holding down the fort. He's over there writing the stories, earning the money, coming back. Oh, it was a great time to be earnest. But he had a problem. See, the problem was he had met someone. Her name was Martha Gellhorn. Many of you know her name because you've seen the movies about Martha, not Ernest. You've seen the articles about the great war journalist, Martha Gellhorn, was more successful as a journalist in war than Ernest ever was as a war journalist. She was the best in the world. She worked for a company called Collier's Magazine. He met her. He loved her because she was a strong woman. By the way, this was a strong, this was a man's man in a woman's body, just like him. When he saw her, he didn't even know she was going to be in Europe. See, Joe Russell originally introduced him one time at the bar in Key West. Met her, thought nothing of it. Later on, old Ernest is standing at the bar, and here come the military troops. Here come the soldiers, the marching soldiers. Here come the big tanks. There goes one tank spinning out of the line, coming right at me. He dove onto the ground, almost hit his head on a pole as he spilled his drink. Got up and thought, how dare this tank driver try to run me over. The hatch flows open, and out of it, Martha driving her own tank. <laughs> Martha, where are you going? I'm going to the front lines. <clears throat> he said, well, I'm going to the front lines too. She said, no, you're going back in the bar. I know you, Ernest, get in. He got in, and off they went to the front lines. Love was pattering in his heart one more time. He was a happy man. A very happy man. But remember his problem? She was still back home, called his wife. Well, old Pauline got wind. She found out about old Martha while they were over there. 
She was very, very angry. When he came home, he walked through the door. When he came home, I mean, yes! <laughs> it was nasty. He was three doors down, said he couldn't sleep for almost a day listening to this crud. Her yelling at him, him cussing at her, glass flying, pot thrown. They fought. I'm going fishing. I'm leaving. I'm getting out of here. She thought, that's good. Stay as long as you want. Oh, I am. And off he went fishing. And she thought, you know what? I'm going to build him a surprise. She contacted Miami immediately overnight, had the supplies brought in, had the teams come in, and she built him a swimming pool. Now this is important. How much did Uncle Gus pay for that house? She built a $20,000 swimming pool at a $6,000 house. Nobody in Key West had ever even seen a swimming pool. First in ground swimming pool anybody ever even seen in the air. Oh man, they lined up all the way around the block to take a look at this thing, a hole in the water in the backyard. Ernest shows back up. What are all you people doing outside my house? Oh, you got to see Ernest. It's good. See what? He walked into the backyard, and right there where his boxing ring used to be, <laughs> across that pool sat a woman with her legs crossed and a drink in her hand. He said, woman, what have you done? She said, I built you a surprise. I built you a swimming pool. He said, how much did you spend on this thing? $20,000. $20,000? The house only cost $6,000. Are you crazy? Whose money did you use? Yours. <laughs> he said, you know what? You might as well, as he dug in his pocket, took out a penny, threw it on the ground, and said, you might as well take the last penny I own. Stormed off. She put her drink down, walked over, picked up the penny, and had it put in the cement. And threw parties for the rest of the time she owned that house and said, that is the last penny Ernest Hemingway ever owned in his life. <laughs> You go there today, I promise you that penny is still sitting right there by the pole where it landed. <laughs> by the way, who bought the house? Gus. Yes. Whose name did he put it in? Holy. That's right, woman scorned. And they got a divorce. Well, when they got a divorce, Ernest had to figure out what he was going to do. He turned to the one woman that he knew was on standby waiting on him, and that was old Martha. And you know what? Pauline was just like Hadley. You're not living here. You're not living in this house. This is my house. My uncle bought this. It's in my name. Martha said, trust me, we're not living there. But Ernest didn't want to leave Key West. He loved the Gulf Stream. He loved his life. He loved fighting. So what he did was, he moved over across to Cuba. He loved his boxing. Loved his fishing. He was a really happy man. This is a good time to be Ernest anyway. It was great. He and Martha were doing really, really well. Had a beautiful, beautiful home. Life started settling down a little bit. He started relaxing a little bit. He was able to write. He finished a fantastic book, a wonderful book, for whom the bell tolls, a long written book. He took a long time writing it. It was a great time. It was a good life. He was able to become an unofficial ambassador for the U.S. to Cuba, taking all those Hollywood friends and royalties and bringing them over, showing them a fantastic time, a great time. It was an exciting time. Oh boy, he missed the sloppy joes. But he found another location, just as good. It was called the Ristorante Floridita. They created his own drink. It was called the Papa Double. It was a double daiquiri. Now, double meaning a daiquiri back then had two shots in it. This was a double. It had four shots of liquor and perfect for Ernest Hemingway. You could go to the restaurant, you could sit in a table, you could order the Papa Double, walk to the bar where the legend stood right in the back, toast him, and drink it. And Ernest would drink it. If you ordered it, he'd drink a drink with you. And the next person, he'd drink one. The next person, he'd drink one. The next person, he'd drink one. At one time, he had 14 double Papa Doubles. One night. That's important because it's also documented. He walked the 12 miles home and at 6 a.m. sitting at his typewriter writing the next morning. Not a slurred word, not a blurred vision. Ripping the paper out, throwing it over his head and letting it float to the ground like a feather because a man who would wrinkle a piece of paper as a writer would be insane within a year, he believed. And he stayed there like a little religion writing his books 
writing his papers. Earned enough money to buy a boat, he called it the Pilar. Very important to Ernest was the Pilar. This was a very important boat. He needed a good captain. He found his friend right down the street in Cuba. He got Gregorio Fuentes, and they became a good team. It was a great time to be old Ernest. Until that date right there, February 16, 1942. Everything changed. Because on that day, he didn't have to go to war. War came to him right there in the Gulf Stream. For that year, the U-boats made an attack on the Caribbean. By the end of that year, over 263 ships were sunk. Ernest had the idea. He went to the ambassador of Cuba. He said, listen, here's what we're going to do. I promise you this will work. I saw it when I was over in Europe. What they did was they took private boats just like my pilar. They left them looking just like they're put inside. Oh, they put dynamite. They put hangers. They put cannons. They put all kinds of artillery so that when the enemy comes up to rob the provisions, bam, we blow them out of the water. What do you think? Well, the real thinking was, this guy's nuts. But it was Ernest anyway. So, he said, here's a box of hand grenades. Why don't you take those? If you see a U-boat, why don't you put the coordinates down radio in and we'll take care of it from there. Ernest wasn't happy. He just got told no. He was not happy. So he came up with his own idea. He had his own little secret weapon. It was called Patchy. You see that picture behind that American flag, that little squirrely man? That was his secret. That's Patchy. Patchy was a man. Patchy was the world's best highlight player. Patchy could take a pin, pull it out of a hand grenade, throw it 50 to 75 feet easily, ring a bucket, a milk bucket, bam, right dead center almost every single time. That's what we're going to do. We're going to take it as soon as they come up. Patchy, go, 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 throw it up. Blow them out of the water. What do you think, buddy? This was a great, great idea in Ernest's head. They never saw a U-boat. Or once again, the story would be ending right here. Martha hated this. You guys, all you're doing is just taking the money, buying a bunch of fuel. And I notice you don't buy a lot of fuel, Ernest. You seem to buy more liquor than you do fuel. Food, all you're doing is just drift around playing war. She hated it. But the world was changing. There was another world war breaking out. Collier's Magazine called her and said, Martha, you're going to the front lines. We need a good journalist over there. We need to tell the world about the war. She said, this time I'm not going unless you send my husband. They said, Hemingway? We can't, we can't afford Hemingway. There's no way we can afford Ernest Hemingway. We can pay you. She said, I'm not going. I don't care what my contract says. You have to take us both. They said, the only way we can do that is we will. We'll take you both. Send you both over there. You both write the story, we'll pick the better of the two. Now think about that for a second. They're going to pick the better of the two, the famous war journalist against the famous novelist, and they're going to pick one of these two. By the way, this put a lot of pressure on them. But they were a very well-known duo in journalism. Very first couple on D-Day, right behind the troops, the first two journalists was Hemingway and Martha. The liberation of Paris, once again, Hemingway and Martha. But they started fighting and arguing over everything. So Collier said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to split you up. One's going to go to one side of Europe. One's going to go to the other. Ernest said, fine. I could use a little space. And he did. While he was up on the north end of Europe, <laughs> welcome to Ernest Hemingway. He met old Mary. And by the way, Mary O'Hemingway says that this is probably the favorite of all the wives that the family ever had. That seems probably the best one that he ever had. Mary was a good wife, but they needed somewhere to live. This time, the house was in his name, and they moved to Cuba. Martha had to leave. While they were in Cuba, the house was right over a nice little marina. One of the captains that managed that marina gave her a cat. It was called a polydactyl cat. A polydactyl cat means it has more than the normal toes on one foot. It means it has like six toes on one foot. But we always hated cats. Terrified of snakes and hated cats. Hated the cats. Why don't we do this? Why don't we kill the cat? She said, you're not killing my cat. I'll go find another cat just to really make sure you don't kill it. We're going to give it a mate. And she did. She went and got her a second cat. Ernest, you need to look at this cat. You need to read about it. You'll understand why I like this cat. Ernest read about the cat, and you know what he figured out? The cat is actually 
a lucky cat. How many natural cats bring, bring wealth, prosperity, happiness? As long as they're not spayed or neutered. Ernest ended up with 57 polydactyl cats. <laughs> if you've ever been to Key West, though, they say they have the cats. And we're in Cuba. That's because Snowball's descendant was actually purchased by the city of Key West, the city council. They registered the cat as a national registry because the cat had a house at the Hemingway house. The Hemingway house was a national registry. So was the cat's house. Therefore, nothing can ever happen to those cats. They can breed and be as happy as they want for the rest of their lives. They have hundreds in Key West, and including a little graveyard. The cat was very important, but he and Mary started traveling. But where did Ernest really want to be? He just wanted to be home. He wanted to do what he loved best. He just wanted to write. That's all he wanted to do. Just leave me alone and let me write. Just let me write. And he was a fantastic writer. A fantastic. He created a fishing tournament. A tournament, because why would you go fishing if there wasn't a competition involved? This whole tournament came out to be a really big tournament all over Cuba. By the way, you know who the first person ever won the very first tournament? That gentleman right there. Fidel Castro won the very first year. Fidel Castro. It was a good time with Cuba and the U.S. Hemingway met Castro. Castro met Hemingway. It was a fine time. There was no negative relations, but all that was coming very, very fast. The man that he actually known and became friends with slightly, but not daily acquaintances. Actually, everything flipped upside down when the separation between the two countries started. It was a good time to be earnest, though. Because at that point, he was at the top of his world. He was at the pinnacle, the very, very top. He wrote a book called The Old Man in the Sea. This book changed my life which is why I'm standing in front of you today talking about this book in honor of one man, Ron Crawford. So who's Ron? Ron was my English teacher, my speech teacher. He was my debate teacher in high school in 1980. I sit on the back row. I was very quiet. I know. I was a little too quick, people. But see, when the reports would come in on a book and he said, here's your assignment, the kids would get up behind the podium and they would shake and, oh, watch your posture, look at your eye contact, leave your hands alone, don't touch the paperwork, make sure you, good pronunciation, tone, voice inflection, oh, they would shake like a cat having kittens. And finally, they would go back to their seats and they would sit down. I got through that. I had a problem. I don't use notes. I don't use podiums. I look at them as a boat anchor. Y'all is right here. So the teacher came to me and he says, here's what I'm going to do, so I'm going to prove to you you've got a really unusual gift. Class, may I have your attention, please? The next assignment is The Old Man of the Sea. It's by Ernest Hemingway. Fantastic book. Don't worry, none of you have to do it. Rick, you have to do it. When you get up here in one week, I want you to have read that book, and I want you to get every one of these people in here that hate reading, because they're kids, I want you to make them so on fire that they read it. I thought I was being punished, but he saw a gift. At the end of that week, I got up there, took the podium, and slid it to a corner, just like I had my guys do today. And I pulled out a jewelry box, and I started holding out gemstones. I took out a fishing box, and I became that captain, the old man in the sea. I became the weather. I became the marlin that was hooked, the oversized marlin, way larger than the boat that was ever supposed to haul it in. I became a shark trying to consume the fish, and the captain trying to hold it all together. By the time I went and sat down, the library had no books of the old man in the sea. For that afternoon, every one of them was checked out. At the end of that class, the teacher came to me, put his hand on his shoulder, and said, Son, your life just changed today. You've got a choice from here. You can take my advice and do what I'm telling you to do, and go out and change other people's lives for the better. Or you can sit and read about it. And if you choose to read about it, there's nothing wrong with that. But I encourage you, you need to go out and find it, live it, and do it while you're young and able to do so. That was 33 years ago. And over 300 days a year, I've spent my life traveling all over the world, living, reading, studying, watching, and learning. And I'll probably do it until I cannot physically do it anymore. For so that book changed my life. This book 
book was fantastic. Oh, by the way, that's not my opinion. Time Magazine serialized the book. Fantastic book. And next year, he actually started winning awards for his books. Not from Time Magazine, the Pulitzer. The next year, right after that, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. You couldn't get any higher than the pinnacle as an author. The top, he's standing on the peak of the mountain of success and greatness. You couldn't get any higher than where he was that day. But he was struggling. He was drinking. And he was depressed. Drinking and depression is a disease. He started losing his mind. It wasn't because of the drinking. It wasn't because of the, the depression. It was because the treatment back then was electroshock therapy. They sent him to Idaho. Checked him into an insane home. He pulled out a piece of paper and he wrote one paragraph. It took him two and a half weeks on those treatments to get some thought out of his head, to get just his hand to stop shaking and make it look like it was just within a half hour of writing. Gave it to his doctor and said, let me be clear with you, doctor. I'm a literary author. I have a Pulitzer. I have a Nobel. I'm a writer. Unless you have those credentials in your field, unlock the door. I'm ready to leave. And the doctor let him out. Ten days later, laying by his wife, Martha, he got out of his bed. Depressed, he walked to his kitchen. Upon arriving at the kitchen, he opened up a cabinet and he pulled out a set of keys, went one more floor down, and unlocked his favorite gun cabinet, selecting very carefully the African rifle. Pulled it out and put it to his head. It was over. We had just lost the greatest literary artist at that time in American history. There was others, but at that time he was the greatest. He was the influencer. This man changed my life. But it's just not mine. He changed many of our lives. He taught us how to live larger than life. Because many of us for our age, we wake up and we think this is it. I'm too old to stop dreaming, to stop planning. But this guy taught us to live us to really grab greatness every single day and move forward with it. It was through his words that he was able to touch the lives of so many. His friendships that he created. His bonds that he was able to create. And the dreams and the aspirations of his writing made us want to travel, made us want to go, made us want to become more. So that every day you wake up if you're like me and you think, where am I? Where do I want to go? And what do I need to do to get there? And as long as you can hold on to a thought like that, it's an exciting day to wake up. This man was a great artist on paper. It's not because he wrote that, wrote that, wrote that, wrote that, or that, nor is it that he won that and won that. He was standing on the very pinnacle, the highest point of his life. But where do you go from there? In my opinion, his greatest work is not on that board right now. His greatest work is the legacy that he lives and the legacy that he left behind when he chose to go. For it's that legacy that has challenged each and every one of us to become the best we possibly can. Life is never done until the very last day. Find your passion, find your greatness, and change your life for the better. The Legend of Ernest Hayes.